said, and he told me to tell you, yes, you can. And those are the words that he spoke, and it was very clear. Yes, you can. And so, yes, you can. And so I wanted to make sure that we finish and really get to the point where God really wanted me to go with this. Because he said, yes, you can. And the scripture that we used was Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I can. Say, yes, I can. Yes, you can. If God says you can, then you can. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, another scripture we use is, but to him who is able to do abundantly above, exceedingly above, all that we can ever ask or think according to the power that works in us. And what power is that? The resurrection power of Christ lives in us. That's the mystery that nobody really gets. The Bible calls it a mystery that Jesus can live right here inside of us. And it's not the Jesus that died on the cross. It's the Jesus that conquered death, hell, and the grave. The resurrected Christ is the one who lives in here. And so we talked about Paul when he was in front of King Agrippa. Remember in Acts chapter 20 when he was in front of King Agrippa? And he's 20, 26. He was in front of King Agrippa. And uh, he, was, uh, he was in prison and he was about to go to Rome uh, to be in prison for the, next, uh, bitten for the next couple of years. And one of the things he said, he said, Oh, King Agrippa, I'm a happy guy. I think myself happy. And so you have to wonder why Paul always thought himself happy, why Paul was always in a good mood, why always said, Paul said that no matter what condition I find myself, he goes, whether I'm abased or I'm not, he says, I'm a happy guy. He says, I count it all joy, no matter what I go through, whether I have money or I don't have money, whether I'm in chains or I'm not in chains, whether I'm, you know, preaching the gospel or I'm not preaching the gospel. He says, I count myself happy. I think myself happy. I'm a happy guy. And if you go over to the next chapter, you'll see that they were on a boat going to Rome, and there was a big storm, and, you know, for 14 days, the Bible calls it a tempest, and Paul finally prays, and he says this. He says, cheer up, because everybody is sitting there crying. Oh, we're going to die. We're in the middle of the ocean. The sharks are going to eat us. You know, we're never going to see our family again. And he said, cheer up. So what he was trying to do is get his enthusiasm, take his spirit of faith and his I can do attitude and slap the people around him so they can catch that attitude. And so when I said, yes, you can, God wants you to take that I can't do attitude and slap it out of you. Get rid of it. Because if God is on your side, there is no one who can say you can't. Either you can or God's a liar. Because he said, I can do all things through Christ. And it really depends on us and the faith that we have. Uh, last week, I ended with, uh, um, uh, about, I spoke about a gentleman named Victor Frankl. Remember that? Victor Frankl was, uh, turned out, he became a psychiatrist. He was a Jew born in Austria. He got, uh, um, he, he was imprisoned uh, in one of the concentration camps uh, during the Holocaust, during the Nazi invasion of the Germans and uh, 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 Hitler. And he watched as his fellow uh, uh, friends, companions, all, most of them died, uh, committed suicide, uh, poisoned, burnt, you know, set on fire, and all the atrocities that comes with the con concentration camps that went on in uh, those days back in, during the Nazis, um, uh, during World War II and the Holocaust. And so he made it out alive. And the question that was asked of him, and he wrote a book on it, and they asked him, why did you survive and all your friends and neighbors didn't? And he said this, he says, because when I was in there, I made a decision in my heart to say yes to life. And he wrote a book about it, and his book is titled, Say Yes to Life. He says, I decided this. He says, no matter what they do to me, no matter what I see around me, I will survive. Now, think about his book. He said, I said yes to life. Say yes to life. He said it, and he kept on saying it, and he kept on saying it, and he believed in what he said, and he made it through. Now, he says this in his book, and this is very interesting. It's something that we as Christians should get. 
He said this, he says, well, I was in there, and he says, there were days that I couldn't eat. They didn't give us food. They robbed that freedom from me to make my choice to eat or not. They decided what I ate and when I ate. They decided when I went to the bathroom and when I didn't go to the bathroom. They decided what I wore and what I didn't wear. They decided who died and who lived. He says, but I made a choice. He says, there's one freedom you couldn't take away from me, and my freedom was to choose to live, to have a good I can do attitude. He says, when I made that decision, my choice to count it all joy, he says, that's the key that got me through, and that's why I, I survived. And so for us, many of us go through challenges. And somebody said this, you know, I thought you Christians, you know, the God is on your side and you go, don't go through any challenges. You don't go in through any trials. And I don't know whoever said that, but that's a myth. The difference is that we know how to overcome, that we can get through it all. And we can come out on the other side smelling nicer, looking nicer, being nicer, because we count it all joy when we go through trials and tribulations that we're not going to come out on the other side in shame and guilt and condemnation. We're going to come out on the other side declaring God is on my side. God did this for me. He made me more than a conqueror. He took me through this, and I give him all the glory. And so Mark, 11 chapter, uh, Mark chapter 11, and that's where we'll start today. Actually, um, you can go to Mark 11. Uh, one of the things I like about Paul, and I mentioned him, a couple times. One of the things I like about Paul is his attitude. And Paul was challenged many times about who he was. Like, what are your credentials? What makes you an expert on the gospel? Why do you think you can preach? And why do you think you can go out and, you know, do signs and wonders and things like that? And in 1 Timothy, he silences them with this. He says, well, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, and he put me into the ministry. So take that, chump. Now, I added that, take that, chump, into it. But what I'm saying is this, that in, in his attitude, because he was always questioned, who are you, Paul? Who said you can be a, you know, in the ministry? Who said you could preach? Who said you're an apostle? And he finally settles it, and he said, I thank my God because he put me into the ministry. Now, if you got a problem with that, you argue with him. Amen? So when somebody asks you, well, what do you, how come you think you're going to heaven? I said, well, I'll tell you why I think I'm going to heaven. Because Jesus came, he died on the cross, he took my sins and my shame and my guilt and my sickness, and he buried it and he rose again, and he said, because he lives, I can live also. If I believe in him, then the resurrection is for me as well. So take that, chump. <laughs> you can add that. That's actually in the Greek. No, it doesn't. It still means chump in the Greek. No, but you know what? Sometimes you just have to have an attitude where I'm not going to quit. You know, what happens when the doctors tell you you, don't ha you, don't, you only have six months to live? You've got to get an attitude. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going under. I'm not going to be defeated by this disease. You can't do this to me. No, absolutely no way. I'm going to... I'm going to declare that by his stripes I was healed. If Jesus died to it, then I'm not going to die to it. He died to it so I can live to healing. Now, Mark 11, uh, chapter 11, I know we talked about this scripture a lot, but Mark chapter 11, go there please, verse 12. <clears throat> Mark chapter 11, verse 12. Everybody good? You here? Amen? You can do all things through Christ? Yes, you can. Mark chapter 11. Verse 12, we know the scripture, Jesus goes up to the tree, it says the fig tree, verse 12, now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry, and seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went out to see perhaps whether he would find anything on it. He came to and found nothing, for it's not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And notice his disciples heard it. In other words, Jesus didn't just whisper to the tree. Thank you for your amen. In other words, Jesus just didn't whisper to his tree. With me. No one's going to eat from you ever again. No, he didn't whisper it to it. He spoke to it. 
and he was very clear, and he was loud enough so his disciples heard it. Good? All right, now let's drop down to where it comes. And now it, it, they, uh, the next day, in verse uh, 19, uh, 20, now in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you was cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. Praise the Lord. Have faith in God. Say, have faith in God. Jesus said, have faith in God. Notice that Jesus didn't say something else like, well, good luck with that. He said, have faith in God. Now, one of the things that stands out about Jesus' ministry, and you'll see this if you read through the Gospels, they always said, they marveled, the Bible says, at what he said and the authority that came out of his mouth. They marveled at it. Remember when uh, he spoke to the seas and the storms and the winds and everything? And the Bible said, who is this guy? That even the, the winds and the seas obey him. So they marveled throughout the whole, all, the, all the Gospels. It always says, like, this guy speaks with authority. There's something different about the way this man speaks. Matthew chapter 8. Go there for a second. Matthew chapter 8. I want to show you this. And remember the centurion man who had uh, his servant was ill? Matthew chapter 8, verse 8. Matthew 8, 8. Get up on the screen if you can. If not, no worries. Matthew 8, it says, The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only, what? Speak a word and my servant will be healed. Do you notice that? Just speak the word and my servant will be healed. He noticed the power in the words that Jesus spoke. Now, I'm going to say this very, very plainly and simply. One of the things that Jesus did over and over again was speak about who he was and why he was here. Jesus said it over and over again, who he was and why he was here. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. He said, I am come to set the captives free. He said, I am come to do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Over and over again, he declared who he was and why he was here. So when we say, when we take our Bible and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have what God says I have. I can do what God, you know why we say it? Because we're doing what Jesus did. He set the example. We are declaring who we are and what we're here for. Oh, praise the Lord. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. I'm here for a purpose. You're here for a purpose. God has a plan for your life. He has a future for your life. He has a race for you to run. He has something for you to finish. He has an assignment on your life. God has a plan for you. And what the devil wants to do, and ready? This is why God said, yes, you can. What the devil wants to do is for you to give up. The reason why God told me to tell you, yes, you can, is simply this, because the devil wants you to quit and give up. Remember when Paul was standing in front of King Agrippa and he said, oh, King Agrippa, I think myself happy. Now, let me tell you why. Paul is now in chains. He's in prison. And I think I said this last week, but Paul had a race to run. Paul had an assignment on his life and his assignment. And if you go back to Acts chapter nine, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, the Bible says a bright light shined around him and he fell on his knees and he said, Lord, Lord. He says, why, you know, uh, you know, and it was, why are you, you know, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me? And then Jesus says this, Paul, I have chosen you, he says, and you will stand before kings. Fast forward 30 years, Paul is now standing before the king. And he says, oh, King Agrippa, 
I am a happy guy, right? You don't know how happy I am. You, 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 you're, he says, you're about to chain me and send me to Rome to stand before Caesar and kill me. He says, but you don't realize that I am, a, I am finishing my assignment. I am about to finish my course, to finish my race, and I'm about to walk into heaven, and God's about to say, well done, thou good. Woo, King Agrippa, you don't realize what this day means to me. You see, God doesn't want you to die young. He doesn't want you to give up, to quit. He doesn't want you to have a pity party. He doesn't want you to get caught up in all the bad things that are going on around you. He wants you to suck it up, get back up on your feet again. His grace is sufficient for you. When you're weak, that's when he's strong. Why? So you can finish your course, run your way, race, and, and, and do the assignment that God has on your life. Yes, you can. Say, yes, I can. Now, Mark 11 again. Let's, let's get this going in full gear. Mark 11. You good? Let's, let's kick this up a notch. Mark chapter 11. So the disciples said, we heard what you said. Right? So Jesus, here's the tree. Remember the tree that you spoke to? Look at it. It's dead. And watch what he says. He says, have faith in God. Say this, have faith in God. Say it again. Have faith in God. So let me tell you this. When the doctors say you have six months to live, what do you have to say for yourself? I have faith in God. When the doctors come and tell you, well, you know, we've tried everything and we don't know what else to do, we've got to give up, and what do you say? I have faith in God. When, when your wife or your husband serves you divorce papers and they say, well, what, what are you going to do? I have faith in God. When your boss calls you in and gives you a pink slip, what do you do? How are you going to feed your family? I have faith in God. When, when everybody else turns their back on you and they betray you and speak about you, what do you say? I have faith in God. When your car gives up the ghost and you have no money to buy a new one or fix it, what do you say? I have faith in God. Woo! When your rent is due yesterday and you have no money and the landlord keeps knocking on your door, you declare, I have faith in God. When your spouse just died and their social security went with them, what do you say? I have faith in God. Amen. Jesus gave the answer on how to successfully finish your course. He said, have faith in God. When you don't know how to answer somebody when they're sitting there, what are you going to do? How are you going to do it? Just say simply, I have faith in God. Praise Jesus. <laughs> I have faith in God that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, Jesus. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Do you have faith in God? Say, I have faith in God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Say, yes, I can. Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22. Yes, I will. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Remember when Jesus was in the garden and he was sweating drops of blood? And he was saying, oh, he says, Father, if you can, remove this cup from me. He prayed three times, right? He didn't know if he could make the cross. And he finally said, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. The devil came to him in the garden and tried to whisper in his ear and say, no, you can't, no, you can't. He said, yes, I can. Luke 22, verse 31. Now I was thinking maybe somebody will, like a light bulb will go off. Somebody will run around the room. Luke, Luke chapter 22, verse 31. Ready? 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 Watch this. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Now, you have to be really careful when Jesus calls your name twice. You got to be careful. And he says, Simon, 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 Simon. Now, you know my real name is Aristotle, right? So when you know when your mom says, Aristotle, 
or when she throws your middle name in, Aristotle James. You know, she doesn't just call you Artie anymore. She goes, Aristotle. You know something's up. So Jesus now calls his name twice. He said, Simon, Simon. He didn't say Simon says. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. Why do you think Satan asked for Simon? Because Simon Peter, we're talking about Simon Peter, was about to get filled with the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. He was about to preach the best message ever preached as recorded in the Bible. He's about to go to Cornelius' house, the Italian dude, you know, the, the Italian guy, and preach the gospel that opened the door to the Gentiles for the Holy Spirit to be poured out to the Gentiles. He's about to rock the world. And he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you. Let me tell you something. You are as dangerous as Simon Peter was. Because you've got Jesus in you too. And Satan has asked for you as well. And you need to say, I ain't giving up. I am not going to quit. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Notice what he says. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. He wanted to turn him into shredded wheat. Satan wanted to make him into cereal. Oh, you didn't get that. Huh? Shredded peat. He wanted to turn Simon into shredded wheat. He said, he has come to try and sift you like wheat. Watch what he says. He says, but I have prayed for you. He says that your faith would not fail you. And when you return to me, he says, strengthen my brethren. So listen, listen clearly. What Jesus was doing is this. He said, Simon, I want to give you a heads up because it's not going to be well for you for a little bit. He says, Satan, Satan is coming. He's asked for you and you will depart from me for a little bit. But he says, your faith would not fail you and you will come back and you will strengthen my brethren. In other words, he wasn't telling him to put him down. He was telling him to encourage him and say, listen, I'm giving you a heads up. There's a certain things coming in your life that are going to try and rock you. But I'm telling you, Peter, he says, your faith will help you stand. What I'm saying is this. When the world comes and knocks on your door and tries to arrest you, take your kids away from you, when things really bad happen to you, what do you do? Yes, I can. I have faith in God. My faith will not fail me during those times. Oh, praise Jesus. Amen. I have faith in God. Faith in God. Say it. I have faith in God. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke, I am your father. Luke chapter 5. No Star Wars fans. Luke chapter 5. Watch this, Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, verse 17, Luke chapter 5, verse 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop, watch this, and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. So let me explain exactly what's happening so you can start to shout in a minute. So prepare to shout. So Jesus is having a meeting and he's healing people in, his, in a house. People, the presence of the Lord was there to heal them. People are getting healed. There's so many people outside that they can't get in. And so this paralytic guy and his four crazy friends... His four crazy friends said, if we, can, if we can get him in the house, we'll just rip the roof off and drop him in from the top of the house. Because, yes, we can. 
So they pick him up and they carry him, this paralytic guy and his four crazy friends, they carry him up on a ladder to the top of a roof and they start to lower him in the midst of Jesus. And the Bible says this, when he saw their faith. Now, let me tell you this. Sometimes faith is not what you say. Sometimes faith is the way you act. Faith not only has a language, faith has a body language also. Jesus saw their body language and he says, that's faith. Now, how many of you ever played sports before? How many of you ever been on a winning team before? And you're sitting in your dugout on your sideline, right? And you look over at the losing side and the losers have a certain body language to them. Losers usually walk around with their heads down, hands in their pockets, kicking rocks around, and they got a loser's limp. But the winning side's got a winner's walk. Look out, because we're going to win this game. We're taking you down and your mother. Winners got a winner's walk. It's a body language. But if you look over on the other side, you could tell they're losing and they know they're going to lose because they look like losers. Now listen, let me tell you what losers usually do. Before the game is over, they are already working on an excuse why they lost. Come on! They're already working on an excuse why they lost. So let me pick on the Jets since they are my team. All right, so the reason why they lost the game, and they're already working on it, before New England beats them, okay, all right, New England did beat them this year. So before New England Patriots beat them, uh, Todd Bowles is already coming up with an excuse, and he's going over to his offensive, you know, uh, uh, coordinators. Okay, what are we going to say this time? <laughs> this is like the fifth time we've lost to them. You got... And you could tell they're working on an excuse because they've got the loser's limp going on, right? And so, all right, and so the game is over. He goes, well, we played a good game, but you know what, Fitzpatrick, we knew the game was not going to go well because our quarterback, Fitzpatrick, woke up with a hangnail on his little toe. And, and believe it or not, it affected his throwing arm. And that's why he had the record-breaking interceptions today. You know, it just goes to show you, you know, you got to check your little fingernail toes on your little toe whenever you have a big game. Let me tell you why I said that. Because a lot of times, we don't really realize that we can win, and we are already setting ourselves up just in case we don't get healed, we don't get the bills paid, this thing doesn't work out for us, well, what if I don't get another job? No, there is no, I don't get another job. You will get a job. You will get a better job with better benefits, and things are going to be better for you. Well, well, my car just broke. Well, you'll get a better car with better things in it, more modern, and it'll be paid for. In other words, you don't have to whisper things, and you don't have to get the loser's limp and already come out with an excuse why God didn't show up in your life. No, yes, I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes, I will conquer this thing. Yes, this sickness will go away. And yes, I will live more than six months, as the doctor said. And yes, I'll live a long and satisfied life. And yes, I will finish my course. And yes, this church will grow. And yes, things will happen for me. The power of God is in my life. His grace is upon me. And yes, I will make it. And I don't have an excuse or something in my back pocket just in case. It's the loser's limp. Let me get that excuse out. But let me get the back pocket excuse out. No, the winner's walk is, hey, I'm going to make it. Here's the winner's walk when you lift your hands and worship God. Listen, you ever see when a team scores a touchdown, what is the thing they do? They do the winner's walk. Ah. One more scripture. Good? Are you good? All right, one more. Go to Acts chapter 14. Acts chapter 14, one more. Praise Jesus. 
Hallelujah. I know some of you got to run, but just give me one, give me two more minutes. Acts chapter 14, verse 7. You ready? Say, I got the winner's walk. Winners run around churches sometimes. Winners leap. Acts chapter 14, verse 7. It says, and they were preaching the gospel there in Lystra, and in Lystra a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting a cripple from his mother's womb who had never walked. Now, listen, could he do the winner's walk? Not at that moment. It's not a trick question. He was crippled. What part of crippled do you not understand? Let me read that again. There was a certain man without strength in his feet, and he was sitting a cripple, C-R-I-P-P-L-E, a cripple who had never walked. So could he do the winner's walk? Not at that time, no. But watch this. This man heard Paul speaking, and now Paul, observing him intently, seeing that he had faith to be healed. Well, if he couldn't walk, then something else about his body gave it away that he had faith to be healed. What do you think it was? His smile. His joy. He's sitting there listening to Paul's word, and you too can be healed. And he's saying, oh, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Just say the word, Paul. So Paul went over and helped him out, and he said, rise up and be healed. And the man jumped, and then he got the winner's walk. So what I'm saying to you is this. You know what? If you're in faith about it and you know you can win, well, let your face know. Tell your face about the victory you have in Christ. Huh? Get a faith, a faith lift. Get a faith lift to your face. Let your face know. Let your mouth know. Let your nose know. Flare those nostrils a little bit. Let your ears flap a little bit. Let your brow know. Let your whole countenance shine and let everybody know, I'm going to make it. You ever see people down and out? You know they attract people because they want people to say, you all right? Why? Because they've already got that back pocket excuse of why they're not feeling good today. Paul said, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I can have the worst day in the world, but I count it all joy. Amen? I th he said, I think myself happy. Or, listen, what he didn't do is, I'm a happy guy. I'm real happy, can't you tell? I mean, it's just, I'm just, I'm just beside myself. I'm so happy I can't even contain myself. No, he said, man, I'm a happy guy. I think myself, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He got the winner's walk. He got the kick. He got the leap. He says, look out, world, man. I can do no matter what I go through. He goes, I'm a happy guy. He goes, and when life comes and tells me to be sad, I'm just going to think myself happy. Why? Because of what is represented here. He died on the cross, and he shed his blood. And when the world said it's over, when he cried out, it is finished, he didn't mean, I'm finished. He didn't mean he was done. He didn't mean he was through. He didn't mean he was all washed up. He didn't mean he was given up. He said, oh, it is finished. And he said, just step out of my way. Give me three days and watch me change the world.